Good morning and welcome to worship at First Baptist Church of Greenville. We are so glad that you have chosen to worship with us today. And it is our prayer that together, whether we're in person or watching uh, online or by way of television, that together we join in and worship the Lord in spirit and in truth because He is worthy of our worship today. So join us as we worship in song, as we open God's Word and hear it preached. May the Holy Spirit speak to us, convict us where we need conviction, and encourage us where we need encouragement. And together we can say that it has been good to be in the presence of the Lord today. Thank you for being with us.
I want to share with you from Psalm 1, verses uh, 1 and 2. As the psalmist says, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Would you join me in prayer this morning? Our Father, we come before your throne of mercy and grace, indeed, with grateful hearts. Lord, we don't deserve your love, we don't deserve your grace that you have so richly shown to us. But God, we've received it, and you've called us into worship, you've called us by name, and God, you've given us the freedom and the privilege, God, the acceptance to be able to worship you today. God, help everything we do be centered on you in this time, in this place. God, as we continue to sing songs of worship, may the words that come out of our mouth be from the depths of our hearts as we reflect on what we're singing. And we're grateful for all of your goodness towards us. Lord, as we hear your words, speak to us today through the power of your Holy Spirit. May you convict us where we need conviction. May you encourage us where we need encouragement today. God, may you meet us where we are, but may you not leave us where we are. Lord, have your way in our hearts and lives today. And we ask it all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for the cross, Lord.
Pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, we come this morning to worship you and praise you and acknowledge you as the giver of all good things, Lord, and the sustainer of life itself. But also, Lord, we come today thanking you in this season, thanking you for our family and our friends, those around us, Lord, that you've given us. Thank you for this church, Lord and the witness it has and the opportunity it gives us to worship you on a regular basis. And we thank you for those that lead this church and we ask a special blessing upon them. We thank you for our nation, Lord. We thank you for the freedom that we have to be able to come here and worship you. But most important, Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died for sinners like me, that we might have salvation in the eternal life with you. And it's in Jesus' name, my Savior, that I lift this up. Amen.
laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, and then you walked right out again. And now death has no sting. the blood of the Lamb. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood of life. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life, brought me from the dark Amen. Let me just say thank you to our choir and template for leading us in Steve before the throne so well. We are blessed week after week to have a wonderful choir that leads us before the throne of God. And uh, for that, we are thankful. So, Steve, thank you for your leadership in that and how blessed we are. Joshua chapter 8 this morning, it's not a typical Thanksgiving sermon Um, But in very much keeping with our theme for the day, it's wonderful how the providence of God, the sovereignty of God always works. When we come to Joshua chapter 8, this is a moment in Joshua's leadership and in the life of the people of Israel 
that they are experiencing gratefulness to God. Isn't it wonderful how God works as we are faithful to the Word of God to bring us to exactly what we need to hear when we need to hear it? And when we come to Joshua chapter 8, uh, though this is not a typical passage that we would go to to think about thanksgiving, uh, it's dripping from the pages of Joshua chapter 8 is gratefulness to the Lord for how He works. Uh, in chapter 7, last week, we saw what happens when we allow sin to go unconfessed and unrepentant in the camp. Uh, Achan disobeyed God, disobeyed the commands of Joshua that God gave Joshua. And when they went in to plunder, Jericho uh, kept the devoted things that he was not supposed to keep. Uh, in fact, he told them when he was found out, he saw, he coveted, and he took. And he went and he hid it under his tent. And uh, therefore, when the battle of Ai comes up, there's no victory. The spies go in and they say, uh, Joshua, we don't need that many men. Just give us a few thousand men. We'll go up. We'll take it in no time and we'll see you in a few minutes. And they come back uh, with their heads down, defeated. And uh, they did not experience the victory of the Lord because God was not with them. For the first time in the book of Joshua, Israel sees what happens when God is not with them. They may be the people of God, but they're not living under the blessing of God. They don't have the protection of God because there is sin in their midst. And it doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter what we confess. If we allow sin to stay unconfessed and unrepentant in our midst, we are not living under the blessing and protection of God. God will not coexist with sin. That's why there is a heaven and there is a hell. There is a heaven for all who follow God's word, follow God's ways, obey God, will live eternity in eternity with God in heaven forever. But there sadly is a hell for all who choose to deny and reject and live in sin for their life. It is a reality because God will not coexist with sin. And we saw that in chapter 7. We come to chapter 8, though. Joshua dealt with the sin just as God told him he must deal with it because the wages of sin is always death. There is no way around it. The wages of sin equals death. Sin never leads to a life-giving path. Never, ever, ever. No matter what it may promise, no matter what it may say it will provide, it never leads to anything ultimately life-giving. And so Achan and those in his household had to die because of the sin in their life. And that concludes chapter 7. When we pick up in chapter 8, though, we're going to find victory. Sin has been dealt with, and Joshua and the Israelites are going to experience victory God's way. I ask you this morning, are you willing to live in victory God's way? Are we willing to find victory God's way this morning? Let's look at Joshua chapter 8, and we're going to uh, take this a few verses at a time. We're going to begin in verses 1 and 2. Joshua 8, verses 1 and 2. The word of the Lord says, Now the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear or be dismayed. Take all the people of war with you, and arise, go up to Ai. See, I have given into your hand the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. You shall do to Ai and its king just as you did to Jericho and its king. You shall take only its spoil and its cattle as plunder for yourselves. Set an ambush for the city behind it. First thing we see about victory, God's way, is that there is victory in God's compassion. There is victory in God's compassion. Last week we saw God's wrath. We saw God's judgment uh, against sin because whenever there is sin in our midst, God's judgment always rests there. God will not turn a blind eye to sin. You and I can cover it up. We can deny it. We can try to hide it. But nothing escapes God, and God will never turn a blind eye to sin. In chapter 7, we saw that Joshua did not even know that, uh, that Achan had sinned. He didn't know what was going on. That's why he, he comes before the Lord. He falls flat of his face, and he's in, in sackcloth and ashes. He's mourning, and then he begins to blame God. God, why did you let this happen? God, if we continue like this, all of the, the people around us are going to make fun of us, and they're going to make fun of you, God. I thought you were with us. 
And God comes to Joshua and he says, get up, Joshua. Stop having a pity party. This happened to you because there is sin in your midst. And until you get rid of the sin in your life, in the camp, in your midst, I'm not going to be with you any longer. And that's what happens even as Christians. Paul tells the Ephesian believers, do not quench the Holy Spirit of God. When you and I, even as believers have a relationship with Christ, but we're in a pattern of life where we won't sin more than we want to walk with Christ. Salvation is not taken from you if you're really saved. Now, if that pattern is, uh, is more in your life than there's a pattern of godliness in your life, it may be that you're trusting in a false sense of salvation. But let's just say there's a genuine Christian who chooses a season of life where he or she won't sin more than they want Christ. God doesn't take salvation from you, but you quench the Holy Spirit of God. And God's favor is not going to rest on you. God's blessing is not going to be there. God is not going to continue to work in and through your life until you get rid of the sin in your life. God has to take sin seriously. But Joshua dealt with it in chapter 7, just as God told him to, uh, as horrific as it was. Joshua dealt with it. And look at how chapter 8 opens. God's compassion is once again towards Israel. God doesn't continue to hold the sin of Achan in the face of Joshua. God doesn't continue to bring it up. He doesn't go back and rehash it. He doesn't harbor ill feelings toward Joshua or the Israelites. He's not telling them, I don't know if I can give you victory in Ai because remember what Achan did. And you better not do it again. God, we we have no record of any of that. I think God is speaking to them. He knows or he hopes that they've learned their lesson as they've They know what God commands. They know God has said, you follow my word and you follow it completely. And if you don't, death shall come to you. And now they've just witnessed that happen. Sin has been dealt with as chapter 7 concludes. And chapter 8 opens and God has moved on. God is ready for the next thing. And that's that's how the compassion of God works in our life. When you come to God and there's sin in your life and you bow before the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and you genuinely say, God, I'm sorry, and you seek his forgiveness, you repent of that sin, you turn from it, you walk the other way, you can't say, God, I'm sorry, give me your forgiveness and continue to walk in sin. That's not what repentance is. And most of the time we want forgiveness without repentance. Well, that's not how it works in God's economy. Forgiveness comes when you repent of your sin, you turn, you turn from it, you no longer live in it, you seek to to honor God and turn away from sin. But when repentance really happens, God doesn't bring it up anymore. That's the compassion of God. And if you and I have anything to be thankful for this week, it's that we serve a compassionate, loving, forgiving God that's not constantly holding sin over our heads. If you're a Christian and you're constantly bombarded by guilt and and shame and sin that you've already repented of, you're no longer living in it, let me tell you something, that is not from God. Now, if you're still living in it and you're a Christian, that is called conviction and that is from God. But if you've repented of sin in your life and that's no longer who you are, it's no longer what you do, that's no longer the pattern of your life, you and God have dealt with it, God has forgiven you, you've turned from it, you're walking in repentance, but you still experience shame over it, that's from the enemy. God doesn't constantly bring our sin back up. We as humans like to do that. We will say we've forgiven somebody, but we like to remind them often of what we've had to forgive them for. God does not do that. He's not doing that here. He comes to Joshua... And he says, don't fear, Joshua. Don't be discouraged. I think Joshua probably had a little problem with fear because in chapter 1, he tells him three times, Joshua, be strong and courageous. The people of Israel even look at Joshua and say, only be strong and courageous. And then he reminds Joshua, uh, be strong and courageous before they take Jericho. And now after Joshua's had to deal with Achan, God comes to him again and says, don't fear, Joshua. Don't be dismayed. Take all the people of war with you and go to Ai. Now, they've already been to Ai. Remember, they, the spies come back and say, we don't need all the men. Just give us a few thousand. They go to Ai, but they come back defeated because the, the, the blessing of God was not on them because there was uncon, unconfessed and unrepentant sin in their midst. But now that sin has been dealt with, God says, go to Ai. You now have my blessing, but this time you're going to have victory. Do you see the difference of walking with God in God's ways and choosing your own way? You can go to Ai and fight the battle on your own, 
But if you're without God, you're not going to have victory. But you can surrender, submit, repent, and, and live under the blessing of God and be obedient to God's commands. And God says, go to Ai, and you're going to have victory 100% of the time. It's all a matter of how we're living in our walk with God. And God tells them, go. And look what God says in verse 1. He doesn't say, as we have seen the pattern already in these eight chapters of Joshua, I will give the land to you. I will give the king to you. God doesn't say that. He speaks in the past tense. Because from God's point of view, it's already done. That's why God speaks about salvation to you and I in the past tense. Because in God's view, it's already done. You are saved. Even though one day we will be saved in the eternal presence of Jesus Christ. And he says, I have given into your hand the king of Ai. I've given his people. I've given his city. And I've given his land. God would be very much justified to say, I've had enough, Joshua. We're not going back to Ai. I can't trust you, Joshua. I can't trust the people of Israel. I can't trust the people you're leading. God could be very angry because he had every right to be because Achan had deliberately disobeyed God's commands. And yet that's not what the compassion of God does. God says, we're going back to Ai. And not only are we going back, but I've given the land, I've given the people, I've even given you the king. But look what he says in verse 2. We take the compassion of God even further. He says, you shall do to Ai and its king just as you did to Jericho. What did they do to Jericho? Well, the walls fell flat at Jericho. You shall do to Ai just as you did at Jericho. But this time, do you see what God says to them? You shall take its spoil. You shall take its cattle as plunder for yourselves. Are you catching what God is doing here? Let me tell you something. If only Achan had waited a little while. If only Achan would have obeyed the word of God, Achan had no clue what was about to come in terms of blessing. Achan was selfish. Achan was uh, only thought about himself. Achan was impulsive. Does it sound familiar? Do we have a problem with that? Do we try to get ahead of God and say, but God, I really want it. But God, I really need it. But God, no one else will know. The only problem is God said no. And when God says no, we don't do it. And you and I have no clue what God has in store the next day. Now, Achan doesn't live to see the blessing of God because he disobeyed God. But Look at what God gives them in chapter 8. What God gives and allows the people of Israel to take from destroying Ai is more blessing than what uh, Achan stole in chapter 7. What Achan hid under his tent cannot compare to what the Israelites are now allowed to get from Ai. You can't hide a cow under a tent. (laughs) And now God says, you can take it. Achan chose to disobey God, and he missed out on the blessing of God, though he thought he was getting it. What Achan was really doing was he was just getting the momentary pleasures of life. Are you living for the momentary pleasures of life today? Are you saying that you're a part of God's plan and God's kingdom, but you're, all you're doing is living a life that's just taking all that God says we shouldn't take? Living the life God says we shouldn't live? Seeking the things God says we shouldn't seek. Consuming our life with things of ungodliness and worldliness because it's just appealing to the human flesh. We're just living out of impulsive desires and we just want to fit in with the world. Don't be an Achan. Because that brings death. And you have no clue what God has in store if you really live life God's way. There is compassion. Uh, James tells us every good and every perfect gift comes down from above. God does not want to withhold good things from his children. God did not want to destroy Achan. It was Achan's problem that led to the destruction of Achan. He chose to disobey the word of God. And now the compassion of God tells the people of Israel, I'm going to fight for you. The battle is now mine if you do it my way. And not only is the battle mine, but you can have it all when we're done. Man, the compassion of God towards us. 
Are you trusting God to fight for you or experiencing the compassion and love and grace and mercy of God, waiting on God's timing and God's best? So many of us try to get ahead of God, and the Bible repeatedly says, wait on the Lord. Let the Lord fight for you. Find victory the Lord's way. Let me tell you something. What God lays in your lap is far greater than anything you can work for, fight for, or achieve on your own. Just wait on the blessings of God. There's victory in God's compassion. Secondly, there's victory in God's commands. Verse 3, so Joshua rose up with all the people of war to go up to Ai, and Joshua chose 30,000 men. A little more than 3,000, isn't it? Valiant warriors, and sent them out at night. He commanded them, saying, See, you're going to ambush the city from behind it. Do not go very far from the city, but all of you be ready. Then I and all the people who are with me will approach the city. And when they come in to meet us, at first we will flee before them. They will come out after us until we have drawn them away from the city, for they will say, They are fleeing from us at first, so we will flee before them. And you shall rise from your ambush and take possession of the city, for the Lord your God will deliver it into your hand. Notice who Joshua's giving the credit here. God will deliver it into your hand. Then it will be when you have seized the city that you shall set the city on fire. You shall do it according to the word of the Lord. See, I've commanded you. So Joshua sent them away, and they went to the place of ambush and remained between Bethel and Ai on the west side of Ai. But Joshua spent the night among the people. Now Joshua rose early in the morning and mustered the people, and he went up with the elders of Israel before the people to Ai. Then all the people of war who were with him went up and drew near and arrived in front of the city and camped on the north side of Ai. Now there was a valley between him and Ai. And he took about, uh, about 5,000 men and set them in ambush between Bethel and Ai on the west side of the city. So they stationed the people, all the army that was on the north side of the city, and its rear guard on the west side of the city. And Joshua spent that night in the midst of the valley. There's victory in God's commands. Do you see the battle plan here that God has given Joshua? We're, we're not told the exchange between God and Joshua, all we hear is God saying to Joshua, I've given them into your hand. I've given you the land, I've given you the people, and I've given you the king. But God also told Joshua his strategy for victory. This is the Lord's uh, battle to fight. Uh, Joshua's the leader, but it's only when they're letting the Lord fight the battle for them. You remember a couple chapters back, before they took Jericho, Joshua had a heavenly encounter with who I believe was Jesus, and he saw a heavenly messenger with a sword there, uh, drawn, ready to fight. And it was only as they followed the Lord that they would get uh, victory. The problem is when they went to Ai before, they didn't follow the Lord. They didn't follow his word. Now the victory is God's because they've dealt with sin God's way. And so they're about to go into battle. And the strategy is, we're, we're told uh, Joshua takes 30,000 men and he's going to place them behind the city and, and hide out. And Joshua's going to take 5,000 men and he's going to go in front of Ai. And he, there's a valley there between them and Ai. And they're going to station there in plain sight. Plain sight. Joshua with 5,000 men. The king of Ai is going to see Joshua with the 5,000 men, not knowing that there is an ambush behind the city with 30,000 men. The king is going to see Joshua and the 5,000 men. He's going to bring all of his warriors out of the city toward Joshua, and Joshua's going to act like a coward. But he's got strategy here. Joshua and the 5,000 men are going to flee when they see the king coming. What is Joshua doing here? It is great military strategy. It's military strategy, not from Joshua, but from, for, from God, because, you know, we serve the King of kings, Lord of lords. Jesus is the commander of the Lord's army, and it's great military strategy. When the king and his army comes out of Ai, and, and they're pursuing Joshua, who's going to be left in the city? It's going to be defenseless. Jericho was shut up. Great defenses around Jericho. But God's strategy there was, I don't need to go through. <laughs> I'll go around. Now Josh, uh, God has a different strategy. He's going to set Joshua up in front, pull the people out. And when the king and his army starts coming, the 30,000 men are going to come from behind. And they're going to attack Ai. And game over. This is God's command. God is the commander going before them. God is the one calling the shots. God is the one who has a battle plan, and it's a perfect battle plan. 
It's very strategic, and God always works with great strategy. Let me tell you something today. I don't know what battles you're fighting, what battles you're in the midst of, but God has a battle plan that is perfect. His battle plan is going to cause the defeat of Ai, his king, and his people, and whatever we're going through today, God has a battle plan, but in order to see victory in your life, in order to see victory in the battles that you're fighting, you have to listen to God's commands and do it God's way. You got to get yourself out of the midst of it. You got to give up any right of pride or whatever to say, look what I've done. Look at how I'm handling life. Look at how strong I am. And let the Lord fight. Which brings us to the third point. There's victory in God's conquest. Look with me at verse 14. It came about when the king of Ai saw it that the men of the city hurried and rose up early and went uh, out to meet Israel in battle. He and all his people at the appointed place before the desert plain. But he did not know that there was an ambush against him behind the city. Joshua and all Israel pretended to be beaten before them and fled by the way of the wilderness. And all the people who were in the city were called together to pursue them, and they pursued Joshua, and they were drawn away from the city. So not a man was left in Ai or Bethel who had not gone out after Israel, and they left the city unguarded, and they pursued Israel. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Stretch out the javelin that is in your hand toward Ai, for I will give it into your hand. So Joshua stretched out the javelin that was in his hand toward the city. The men in ambush rose quickly from their place, and when he had stretched out his hand, they ran and entered the city. They captured it, and they quickly set the city on fire. When the men of Ai turned back and looked, behold, the smoke of the city ascended to the sky, and they had no place to flee this way or that, for the people who had been fleeing to the wilderness turned against the pursuers. When Joshua and all Israel saw that the men in ambush had captured the city and that the smoke of the city ascended, they turned back and slew the men of Ai. The others came out from the city to encounter them so that they were trapped in the midst of Israel, some on this side and some on that side, and they slew them until no one was left of those who survived or escaped. But look what verse 23 says. But they took alive the king of Ai and brought him to Joshua. Let me tell you something. Hollywood couldn't make a battle movie more perfect than this because God is now in charge and they're listening to God they listened to his commands and Joshua repeated the commands to Israel and to the army and said you spies listen up last time you said we only need 3,000 men and look how that turned out now God wants to send 30,000 this way and 5,000 this way and God wants to include everybody because in order for us to fight in faith we've also got to fight in obedience We've got to trust God, and then we've got to obey God, so we're taking everybody. You may not need, think you need all your resources, but if God says he wants everybody included, everybody's going to be included. And that's what Joshua told the people. He commanded them, but then it was not enough to listen to God's commands. Now they had to fight. They had to put into practice what they trusted in faith. And so you can believe today that you, you're in the midst of a battle. And you can believe that God has a battle plan for your life. And you can listen to those commands of God. You can read His Word and you can hear the fact that God fights for you. You can read the, the fact that God will never leave you nor forsake you. You can read the fact that God has compassion towards you. You can read Matthew 11 and hear Jesus say, Come to me, all you who are weary laden and heavy laden. Give me your burdens. Take my yoke. It is light. And I want to give you this exchange. I want to give you peace for your worries and anxieties you can hear all of that but until you act on it you will never experience it you will never experience it and that's the hard part it's easy to sit in church it's easy to sit at home and open your bible it's easy to read in a devotion book what you need to do but the hard part is getting alone getting real with god and doing it And here we see victory in the conquest because Israel was willing to fight in faith. Are you willing to fight in faith today? 
Fight in faith when it makes no sense to those around you. Fight in faith when it makes no sense to you. Fight in faith when it seems that you're really doing nothing except sitting there and sometimes just letting the Lord take it and trust Him and and, and wear your knees out day after day after day in prayer, asking God to come through, asking God for victory. And as you pray, you get up from that time of prayer and you seek to live a life of holiness and righteousness before God, obedient to His Word. And that is what it means to be fighting. And that's what it means to have victory in conquest of the Lord. Is the Lord fighting your battles today or are you fighting them on your own? Fourthly, we see victory in God's cleansing. I'm not going to read these verses for the sake of time, but verses 24 through 29. Basically, Joshua takes, they take all the city. Just as God said they would, they they take the plunder, they burn the city, and then Joshua takes the king. He comes alive to Josh, he's brought alive to Joshua. And look what the text says in verse 28. So Joshua burned Ai and made it a heat forever, a desolation until this day. He hanged the king of Ai on a tree until evening, and at sunset Joshua gave the command, and they took his body down from the tree and threw it at the entrance of the city gate and raised over it a great heap of stones that stands to this day. Let me tell you something, there's victory in God's cleansing. Before Israel could experience victory in Ai, it had to be cleansed of sin, so Achan had to die. Now that Ai is taken, Ai was a, a, an evil city before Israel. Remember, what is all this about? All of this is about Israel moving into the promised land. And so in order for Israel to take the promised land, they've got to rid the promised land of all the evil. And this means the foreigners, those who didn't serve Yahweh God. It's got to be cleansed. And the king of Ai represents that cleansing that's got to happen. They've taken his city, and now Joshua takes him and hangs him on a tree and takes his body down and buries him under a heap of stones to represent the cleansing that just happened in Ai. Do you remember anybody else who hung on a tree? Who was buried in a tomb except three days later he walked out? And he is the cleansing for you and I. Let me tell you something this morning. You will never experience uh, victory in your life. You will never experience victory in the battles, whether they're financial battles, whether they're health battles, relational battles, whatever. You will never experience victory in any of those, no matter how hard you try on your own, no matter how hard you try to give the battle to God, until you experience victory in the cleansing of Jesus Christ. The greatest battle you have in your life right now, if you're not saved, is the battle of sin. And the Bible says that Jesus hung on a cross 2,000 years ago outside the city gates. He hung there, and on him the wrath of God was consumed for the whole world. That whoever would believe in him should never have to perish, but face eternal life. His body was taken down off that cross, placed in a tomb, and three days later he came walking out. To say, victory is mine, and for all who believe in me. And John 14, 6 says, there is no way to be right with God. Jesus is the only way, the way, the truth, and the life. No way to be right with God, only through him. Have you trusted that today? Lastly, there's victory in God's consecrated word. Joshua Verses 30 through 35, basically Joshua takes all of Israel after they've experienced victory and they have a worship meeting. He gets them together, he gets out the law of the Lord and look at what verse 34 says. Then afterward, he read all the words of the law, the blessing and just the blessing. He read all the words of the law, friend, the blessing and the curse. Can I just stop right there and say there are many people in the world today who are okay with hearing the word of God read to them as long as you read the blessing? There are many preachers today who are okay with preaching the word of God as long as they preach the blessing. But Joshua stood before the people and he said, we've got to read all of it. The blessing and the curse. And if you really want to be right with God, you've got to believe all of it. And you've got to follow all of it, and you've got to trust all of it. He read the blessing and the curse according to all that's written in the book of the law. 
There was not a word of all that Moses had commanded, which Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel, with the women and the little ones and the strangers who were living among them. Isn't that a beautiful way to end this victory? How is Joshua leading the people of Israel after they've just experienced great military victory? He's saying, come, let's worship God. And any true worship of God is always centered on the Word of God. Now, at this point in history, all that they had of the Word of God was the law of Moses. They didn't have the the canonized scripture that you and I hold in our hands today. They had the law. They had the written law. But Joshua took it out. And he read of the blessing and the cursing, reminding them, if we are going to continue forward and we're going to continue in this battle for the promised land and we're going to continue to experience victory, we've got to be a people committed to the word of God. And can I tell you, church, today in 2023, if we are going to move forward in this city, in this state, in this nation, in this world, and be a people that God's favor is upon, that God's blessing is upon, that walks in the victory of the Lord, that no matter what is before us, we know God is there and God's going to fight our victories, we've got to be a people committed to the Word of God. We can either take it or we can leave it. But God is not going to give his blessing on a people that does not take the whole counsel of his word seriously. He's just not. And that's why Joshua comes to the end of this great uh, book and he says, It's up to you. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And Joshua knew exactly what it meant to serve the Lord. He knew serving the Lord was being faithful to the word of God. In Revelation chapter 12, at the end of all of it, this is quickly becoming one of my favorite verses in the, new, in the Bible because I, I believe we're, we're getting here quicker than we would, many of us would like to realize. But in Revelation chapter 12, in verse 11, speaking of the great battle of the end time, John says, and they overcame him, meaning the enemy. They overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life, even when faced with death. Do you want to live in victory of God today? Do you want to be an overcomer today, whatever it is you're facing? Let me tell you the only way to overcome. First of all is by the blood of Jesus Christ. You will never overcome anything in your life, no matter how it may look in the moment. You will never overcome anything if you're not covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. But you can overcome the greatest power that stands in your way, sin, if you are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. He died for you. He rose from the dead for you. Have you given your life to him? Second way to overcome John says it's by the word of their testimony, which is the word of faith, which is the word of God. Got to be faithful to the word, church. As you go out there and live in the world, don't be ashamed of the word of God. Don't tell people what they want to hear. Tell them what they need to hear. Uh, we, We talk about wanting love, 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 more love, more love, more love. Let me tell you, the most loving thing you can do is tell somebody the truth. If you say you love me, but you tell me a lie, I don't think you love me. Especially if it's something very important. If we tell the world we love them, if we tell non-believers we love them, but we tell them sin is okay, we're telling them a lie, and one day they're going to stand before Jesus and they're going to look at us and say, why didn't you tell me the truth? The word of God. And then lastly, John says, they didn't love their life even until death. They were faithful to King Jesus. You want, to be, you want to have victory today? Be covered in the blood of the Lamb. Be faithful to the Word of God. And realize this life is not your own. Keep your eyes on Jesus and fight God's way. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I don't know what decision God has spoken to you this morning. I don't know what battle you're in the midst of. Maybe it's a battle of sin. Maybe it's a battle of trying to do it on your own. Maybe it's a battle of health. Maybe it's a battle of relationships or 
uh, finances or something other in your life that's just really big and just seems to be consuming you and it's all you can think about. It's, it's causing great stress and worry and anxiety in your life. You feel forgotten by God. You feel not seen by God. And I would just to ask you this morning, can you just ask the Holy Spirit to examine your heart? Maybe salvation needs to happen. Maybe you need to be covered by the blood of the Lamb. Maybe, maybe as a Christian, you need to surrender to Him. These things. Maybe you need to stop trying to fight it on your own and, and understand how victory comes God's way and be committed to Him, turning your back on everything else. Would you just ask the Lord this morning how He wants you to surrender so that He can truly fight the battles in your life? Father, Thank you for loving us. Thank you for the grace of Jesus in our life. Lord, we have so, so, so very much to be grateful for. We don't deserve salvation, but your compassion, your, your, your kindness, your commands, your, your victory is towards us. Help us step in it today, however we need to, whether it's first time salvation whether it's a recommitment, whether it's just kneeling at this altar and saying, Lord, the battle is yours. I'm tired. I'm tired of fighting it. I'm tired of failure. Maybe we need to come before you this morning interceding on behalf of someone else who so desperately needs to know your love towards them. God, would we just trust you today? Would we just trust you as the commander that you are? as the, the giver of all good things that you are. And when we just trust you and walk in obedience, meet us here, but don't leave us here. Lord, we ask all of this in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us in worship today. I pray that the Lord has spoken to you in some way through our time of worship together and the preaching of his word. If the Lord has laid a specific decision on your heart, please note the contact information there on your screen and reach out to us so that we can guide you in the next steps, whether it's a decision of faith, a recommitment to the Lord, or just a prayer need that you might have. Our staff is here ready to serve you. Thank you for being with us, and we hope that you will join us next time.